Human heart holds violence. Assault comes from people. Disdain wears human face. Conspiracy hides in human guise. Since the dawn of history, it has been like that. There was a king, and this king needed money. He only had two options. The first one was gold mining and minting his own coin. One of the examples is authentically great Polish king Kazimierz. However, if the country didn't have deposits of gold and silver, there was always a second option. The gold had to be stolen from someone. For this purpose, the man defending country were killed, women were raped and kids were sold to slavery. The option number two was more popular possibly due to the perverse nature of man. It was used more often even though the first option was available. Roughly speaking, that's how the economic history of the world looks like according to Jan Cliff. So the finance and management lecture is over, so let's dive in into our main topic. We live in unusual times, not because zombies are loitering the streets, looking at their electron brains. It's also not about the triumph of technology over humanity. The drawing I'm into for the whole day could have been done by artificial dude AI in minutes. Nevertheless, I will continue to scrape with a dull pencil on a piece of paper. It will be a tale set in history. After many years of ignorance, I must admit that the history of the world is fascinating. I was not interested in it before. I vividly remember the faces of my history teachers and the tears dripping over their cheeks. But despite that, I will tell you about people, pathetic scumbags who were nicknamed the Great. Their remains rest in grand buildings and are revered by other greats of our world. It will also be a tale about incredible and truly great people who have been forgotten by history. Very often their bones were turned into ashes, and if their names are ever mentioned, they are ridiculed and mocked. There is no space for them in the official version of history, and there never will be as long as this world lasts. But I remember and will pass this knowledge on to you, so you can remember. And perhaps you will spread this knowledge further so that others can remember. After that lengthy introduction, let's jog into the main topic of our film. Let's talk about fundamental human rights, something that is obvious for us. Let's talk about our right to have an opinion and free speech, and consequently, a freedom of conscience. Everybody knows that some topics are available only on the Internet. You will never hear about them in the mainstream media. However, sensorial inclinations of Google, YouTube, Facebook or Twitter make me feel that the remaining of this freedom will disappear completely. There will only be some videos of cats climbing over curtains, about dogs peeing on their noses, or all those clueless chicks showing off their bulging body parts, mostly impressive, I must say. The other topics will disappear. Not only will they disappear, but anyone who will dare to talk about them will be in trouble. 
Professor of Psychology Clinical na University. That's Jordan Peterson, a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Toronto in Canada. He is one of the most renowned intellectuals of our times. His opinions mentioned during interviews and on Twitter have triggered a smear campaign against him. He can lose his professional license if he refuses court-mandated re-education. I can assure you that this lad is really, really smart. The idea of re-educating such a wiseacre, where a few morons will be telling Peterson that such things as gender does not exist, and that a man and a woman is just a creation of a sick mind, is a topic for a great comedy. That would be a blockbuster. However, it happens in real life. It's not a niche movie or a pseudo-documentary commented by a famous YouTuber. Rowan Atkinson, the British actor and comedian, while speaking at the symposium dedicated to free speech, mentioned that he is no longer allowed to laugh at any subject. He stated that today's reality resembles a character from an absurd comedy series in which he played. There was a Constable Savage arresting people for offenses such as walking in a loud shirt in a built-up area during the hours of darkness, walking round all over the place, or urinating in a public convenience. The phenomenon of fact-checkers can be quite concerning. The assumption that an average person is too stupid to think independently is an opening to censoring any expression. This scheme assumes the existence of a censorship organization, which checks the reliability of any information, just like in Soviet Russia. I'm wondering who is responsible for checking on fact-checkers and this Ministry of Truth. Maybe they have a monopoly for infallibility from the Vatican Academy of the Only Truth. When freedom of speech fades away, in its wake, the freedom of conscience disappears as well and tyrants are rising their heads. This tale of fighting for the right to own one's opinion and conscience has its roots in ancient times, and that's where we will begin. This story will be long and unfortunately bloody.
systemy rządów od czasu The earliest historical records clearly show that systems of government were not tolerant. The king was a ruler of the bodies and souls of his subjects. He was representing the authority of the country and the highest religious majesty. The belief of the monarch was the religion of the country. The freedom of conscience was never respected. There were obviously some exceptions. The Babylonians claimed that instead of fighting with deities of conquered lands and forcing the people to give glory to Babylonian pantheon, it was necessary to assimilate them. They could worship their deities, but at the same time, they were gradually shaped to become a part of the Babylonian Empire. That was the entire system of gradual shaping. Jews, who ended up in Babylon after the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar in 586 BCE, blended their belief system with the Babylonian. Since then, we talk about Talmudic Judaism, with Kabbalah, the Hebrew occultism, as its foundation. And it continues to this day. Despite that apparent tolerance, there were some cases where all the officials and rulers of the province had to show their submission to Marduk and the glory of Babylon. The last king of Judah, Zedekiah, also performed such a formality, confirming his vassal status by taking an oath which he later broke. In the third chapter of the book of Daniel, three high officials refused to worship the Babylonian deity. They were Hebrews. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if ye be ready, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made. Well, but if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? The third chapter of the book of Daniel and the thirteenth chapter of the book of Revelation complement each other. It's impossible to understand the book of Revelation of John without knowing the Old Testament. It's like a manual. The thirteenth chapter of the book of Revelation is absolutely impossible to decipher without Daniel. Apart from that, it's its development. In both chapters, there are the same elements, a statue and an image, a decree that disregards human conscience. In both of them, there is enforced worship of the statue, and non-compliance with the order carries the penalty of death. Also, in both of them, there is number 666. In the book of Daniel, dimensions of the statue are given. The golden statue was 60 cubits high and 6 cubits wide. According to Babylonian numerology, it also had a depth of 6 cubits. For Daniel, who was educated in schools of Babylon, it was obvious. Then an herald cried aloud, to you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at what time ye hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. And whoso falleth not down and worshippeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Somehow I get the feeling that music holds great significance here. It induces euphoria, and it's easier to change one's moral standards. 
When everyone jumps, we tend to jump too. When everyone takes a bow, why can't we do the same? It's an automatic process. In this concrete example, this method won't work. These people were determined to defend their freedom of conscience. This is the image of the situation that will be occurring for all the centuries. Draconian state laws, threats, intimidation, manipulation and ultimately the death penalty for the disobedient. It set an example for every person in ancient Rome or medieval Europe who decided to remain true to their beliefs and the consequences were severe. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O King. But if not, be it known unto thee, O King, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. No pagan ruler described in the Bible received as positive an opinion as Cyrus. He was the son of Cambyses, the last legitimate king of the Meds. Nabonid of Babylon, Amasis of Egypt, the Spartans, and Croesus of Lydia in Asia Minor formed an alliance against Cyrus. They decided to assert control over the young and energetic ruler, who was rapidly developing his state. It came for nothing. Cyrus was far too mighty. After conquering Sardis, considered an impregnable fortress, he attained a position that enabled him to achieve another great victory. Babylon was a fortress among fortresses. Since the Assyrian king Sennacherib, no one dared to besiege Babylon. No one was crazy enough to attack this mighty city. Its walls were strengthened and gigantic, and the provisions of water and food in case of a siege were immeasurable. Cyrus the Great captured Babylon in 539 BC. His name appeared a hundred years before his birth in the prophecies of Isaiah. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden, to subdue nations before him, and I will loose the loins of kings, to open before him the two-leaved gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee, and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, and cut in sunder the bars of iron, and I will give thee the treasures of darkness, and hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. The fame of the great Cyrus preceded him long before he appeared in any region. Like no one else in the world, he ruled over conquered nations fairly and without cruelty. Not only the Hebrews admired Cyrus, he allowed them to return to their homeland. Even the residents of Babylon, weary of the anarchy under the rule of Nabonidus and Belshazzar, welcomed him as a liberator. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him an house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God which is in Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver, and with gold, and with goods, and with beasts, beside the free will of earring for the house of God that is in Jerusalem.
Jego władza po zdobyciu Babilonu trwała zaledwie 9 lat. His rule after the conquest of Babylon lasted only 9 years. His death caused great sorrow among his subjects. The Persian Empire survived for the next 200 years. The kings who followed him ruled with an iron hand, and their empire extended from Egypt to present day, Afghanistan and Pakistan. These were Cambyses, Darius, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, and a few others. In matters of conscience, the Persians were rather tolerant. However, after the death of Cyrus in Persepolis, every provincial governor had to pay homage to the great Shahanshah, the king of kings. That's what they called themselves. Alexander the Great defeated the Persians in the Battle of Gaugamela in October 331 BC. After the victory over Darius III, Alexander entered Pasar Gadai, where the golden sarcophagus with the body of Cyrus was located. He bowed respectfully before the tomb of the great Persian. On the walls were inscriptions in Old Persian. According to Plutarch's translation, it read as follows. O oh man, whoever you are and wherever you come from, for I know you will come. I am Cyrus, who won the Persians their empire. Do not therefore begrudge me this bit of earth that covers my bones. Alexander commanded the tomb to be secured and sealed, but it proved futile. In later years, the tomb was looted and has remained empty since. In 1879, a clay cylinder inscribed with cuneiform writing was discovered in the foundations of the Esagila Temple in Babylon. It carried a message from King Cyrus to the Babylonians. The inscription, though carrying a hint of propaganda, conveyed Cyrus's claim that Marduk had spoken to him and directed him to conquer Babylon. It implied the deity's dissatisfaction with Nabonidus' rule. Nabonidus was the principal ruler, with Belshazzar serving as co-regent. Atheist scholars had long argued that Belshazzar was a mere biblical legend, a figure who never existed, until evidence supporting his historical existence was unearthed. Hence, in the book of Daniel, Belshazzar offers the prophet a position as the third ruler in the kingdom. The motive was straightforward. Belshazzar occupied the second position. In verse 32 of the cylinder it reads, I returned the images of the gods who had resided there to their places, and I let them dwell in eternal abodes. I gathered all their inhabitants and returned to them their dwellings. This is a reference to the decree written in the book of Ezra, urging the Hebrews to return and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Sometimes, Cyrus's cylinder is considered the earliest example of a legal document that, long before the English Magna Carta, ensured human rights. In my opinion, this might be a slight overinterpretation. Without looking far, slavery still existed in the Persian Empire. After the Persians, the Greek Empire emerged, which was relatively tolerant, except for instances like the Seleucids, such as Antiochus IV Epiphanes, known from the apocryphal books of the Maccabees. Nevertheless, there were no legal acts protecting the rights to freedom of conscience. Moreover, none of the ancients thought in such terms. It was not part of the human mindset. Great Pompey cleared the waters of the Mediterranean of pirates in a few months and carried the Roman eagles to the Caucasus. It was he who defeated and dethroned the last Seleucid in Syria. After the Greek Empire, the Romans attained the status of a superpower, and one empire transitioned to another. Besides, 
Romans. The Romans would always be under the influence of Greek philosophy and culture. I will talk about Rome in the following chapters. Despite a few tolerant rulers, the principle remained unchanged. According to the rulers, the monarch was the master of the conscience of his subjects. This functioned from time immemorial and was almost universally accepted. And the world would have stayed that way if not for a certain event. It happened in a small provincial and very poor country on the outskirts of the Roman Empire. There, even a piece of dried fish was considered a delicacy. These people were extremely poor. That country was Judea, where even the wealthiest could only be very poor relatives of the Roman aristocracy. And right there, during the time of Emperor Tiberius, a man overturned this tyrannical principle in just a few words. This humble man presented principles that later became the foundation of all freedom. And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar, or not? Shall we give, or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny, that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. There are representatives of the church, the Pharisees, as well as representatives of the state, the Herodians, in perfect harmony, church and state. The question was extremely tricky. Every answer would qualify as treason. If Jesus had said that it is not necessary to pay taxes to Caesar, then the Romans would have taken action against him. Such views were advocated by the Zealots, a group of fervent and fanatical followers of Judaism. They were the ones who mainly incited constant uprisings against the Roman invader. Uprisings erupted practically every year and were drowned in a sea of blood by the Romans. The Pharisees, these Hasidim, pious ones, were very similar to the Zealots. The second answer, one must pay taxes to Caesar, would provide an opportunity to slander and accuse Christ by the Sanhedrin, a kind of Jewish parliament. The denarius was a silver coin that was widely used in ancient Rome from the late 3rd century BCE to the 3rd century CE. Whose image and inscription is this? asked Christ. On Roman denarii, the portrait of the emperor who held a divine status appeared along with the inscription Pontifex Maximus. The emperor was not only considered a god, but also the highest priest. For the Hebrews, this was blasphemy. Therefore, Jesus' response was surprising and masterful. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. No one before in the history of the world had formulated such a thought, Thavmazo, they marveled. The entire intricate plan crumbled. What belongs to secular authority should be given to it. However, secular authority has no right to interfere in the realm of human conscience. These are words from another world. The depraved human mind would never ever have conceived of this. Do you like various cosmic stories? He was a genuine cosmic being. He claimed to be the Son of God. 
and undoubtedly he was. The only thing is that people don't want to accept such a cosmic being. Man always strives for maximum concentration of power, absolutism, and authoritarianism in the religious sphere. I'll repeat it. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. This answer set the standard forever. Without this one sentence, there would be no John Locke, Montesquieu, and modern constitutionalism. So, did people accept this definition? Were they pleased? Did they implement it immediately? And if not, what would be the realities of this struggle for freedom of conscience? Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. What was the world in which these words were spoken? Absolutely tyrannical. Here I've drawn Herod the Great, when he was still a young man. I drew him based on a quite battered bust of the Idumean. He looked promising as a young lad. I'll briefly tell the story of his life during this period. Before Herod came to power, Judea bled from successive rebellions against the Romans. In just one uprising led by Peshtolaos, 30,000 Jews perished, and another 30 were sold into slavery. How many widows, orphans, and cripples remained? Each subsequent rebellion increased the fiscal oppression of the poor country. The Romans tightened the screws. Every outburst of dissatisfaction was a pretext for more waves of violence. Every new national uprising brought even greater bondage. All these desperate national uprisings had their ideological underpinning. The War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness was an apocryphal book, meaning a book of unknown authorship and origin circulated by the Essenes sect. It gave hope to the tormented people of Judea. This excerpt shows what kind of literature it was. Gather up thy spoils, O author of mighty deeds. Lay thy hand on the neck of thine enemies, and thy feet on the pile of the slain. Smite the nations, thine adversaries, and devour the flesh of the sinner with thy sword. Fill thy land with glory, and thine inheritance with blessing. It's like a mixture of Sienkiewicz with the Book of Enoch. This was how the ground was prepared to reject Jesus of Nazareth. They were waiting for a powerful Messiah, described in the, the War of the Sons of Light against the Sons of Darkness. That's why Jesus would leave places where new waves of fanaticism were emerging, and people, in euphoria, wanted to proclaim him king. This great monarch was supposed to be a victorious anointed one, a messiah trampling the hated Kittim, meaning the Romans. For 40 years, the sons of Judah and Benjamin, priests and Levites, were to engage in deadly struggles with the Kittim. They would fight not only people, but also angels. It was a cosmic war. Three times the sons of light would triumph, and three times the demonic Kittim. But to win, the sons of light had to become perfect through zeal and meticulous adherence to the requirements of religion. Rule after rule, regulation after regulation, just to achieve religious perfection. Then the Messiah would come. Hundreds of bizarre rules were created. Nothing was allowed on the Sabbath. Lockdown. 
To dlatego, gdy Jezus That's why, when Jesus and the disciples were picking grain and eating it on the Sabbath, they were accused of violating the laws of the covenant. According to the Hasidim, it was a harvest and grinding grains, meaning making flour on the Holy Sabbath day. A severe penalty was threatened for that. These absurdities were overwhelming and difficult to understand. One event elevated young Herod to power. After the death of Pompey in Rome, an absolute power struggle began. The Egyptian king Ptolemy XIII, understanding these sentiments, decided to cook two vegan burgers in one pan. He wanted to get rid of his hated sister Cleopatra and at the same time gain the favor of the troops loyal to Pompey and the Roman Senate. Smart Chuck, wasn't he? He knew that if he didn't kill Cleopatra, his vengeful, cunning and power-hungry sister would kill him. It seemed that Ptolemy had all the cards in his hand. Caesar's troops were far away, and he himself, along with Cleopatra and a group of his loyal veterans, was besieged. However, Ptolemy underestimated Caesar's cleverness and military genius. The general defended himself valiantly and sometimes even counterattacked. From the beginning, however, he knew that his situation did not look rosy. In fact, it was desperately bad. Okay, I'll say it. Tragic. He sent out calls for help in all directions. Strangely enough, there were no volunteers. Suddenly, I think it was just an unfortunate coincidence, everyone had their phones turned off. This is undoubtedly a case of chance. However, Antipater the Idumean, the father of Herod, came to his aid with a force of a thousand and five hundred Judeans. A brutal battle erupted. But Ptolemy XIII was losing, and he ordered a retreat. During the crossing, he drowned in the river, and the defeat of the Egyptians was total. Caesar entered Alexandria in a triumphant procession, where just a few days earlier, he faced the threat of destruction. The Roman commander never forgot to whom he owed his salvation. Antipater was the father of Herod by his mother Kypros, who was Nabataean. Antipater became the Epitropos, the administrator of Judea on behalf of Rome. His son, Herod, became the king of Judea. Herod the Great, he should be distinguished from his sons, Herod Antipas, Herod Archelaus, and the two Herods Philips. At the time of Jesus, it was Archelaus who was the tetrarch of Judea. Of all his brothers, he was the worst tyrant. He was the image of his father. The Jews despised Herod because he was a foreigner. He was neither a Jew from his Idumean father's line, nor from his mother's lineage. But that was not the greatest problem. This man became an ardent Roman collaborator. He even dared to hang a pagan Roman eagle in the Jerusalem temple. He did everything to please the empire. When young devout zealots smashed this pagan symbol, he ordered them burned alive as an example. In later years, he became pathologically suspicious. He created an extremely efficient security apparatus. His agents were everywhere, knowing everything that happened in Judea and neighboring states. Before the spark of rebellion ignited, Herod's agents were already among the conspirators, pretending to be one of them. He systematically killed members of his own family. He even killed his beloved young wife, Mariam, of the Hasmonean family, thinking she was plotting against him. Later, it turned out not to be true. To my knowledge, a woman cannot live without her head. He regretted this decision until the end of his life. He purged the Sanhedrin of Rome's opponents, killing them and leaving only collaborators and opportunists, solidified trolls. 
I właśnie za panowania tego króla na skrawku lodu, And it was under the rule of this king in a land shaken by successive crimes in the city of Bethlehem that Jesus Christ was born. Skrajnie wrogich i nieprzyjaznych. And it is precisely in these extremely hostile conditions when the whole world is prepared to reject him that he begins his perilous and bitter earthly journey. Ziemską wędrówkę. I wiecie co? And you know what, friends? The world will never be the same again. Kingdoms will rise and fall. Great sages will deliver their discourses to the applause of sycophants. Once criminals, later saints, their bones adored by crowds. More great tyrants will appear, and their bodies will crumble to dust. However, regardless of opposition and hatred towards him, the name of Jesus of Nazareth and his words will be on everyone's lips until the end of the world, until the time of tyrants is fulfilled. The Roman Republic lasted for nearly 500 years. It did not have a monarch, but it was a self-governing entity. It is generally accepted to have begun with the overthrow of the tyrant Lucius Tarquinius in 509 BCE. The Romans established a system of elective magistrates with the Senate at the top, followed by four assemblies, Comitia Curiata, Centuriata, plebis and tributa. Their republican form of governance even influenced their military rules, surpassing the Greek phalanx. In the Roman army, during a battle, a centurion could issue different orders if the situation demanded it, even if it contradicted the overall commander's orders. This did not mean there was anarchy. These soldiers were highly disciplined. In the year 202 BCE, Scipio Africanus defeated the multi-ethnic Carthaginian army led by the brilliant Hannibal in the Battle of Zama. The Roman Republic emerged as the master of the world, and Carthage was definitively destroyed by 146 BCE. The Roman Republic continued to function as a republican and later imperial empire until 476 CE. At that point, the victorious Germanic chieftain Odoacer deposed Romulus Augustulus, the last emperor of the Western Roman Empire. This is the commonly accepted narrative. However, as we will see, the truth is more complicated. The Roman Republic controlled the entire Mediterranean region, including Spain to the west, France from the Pyrenees to Nice, Italy, Illyria, Sardinia, Sicily, the Greek islands, and the coasts of Asia Minor. All of these were Roman provinces. The territories of Carthage, Tunis, and Tripoli also became part of the empire. Other territories, extending to the Euphrates, including Syria, were ruled by monarchs subject to Rome. This was also the situation in Judea. Fourth beast was terrifying and frightening and very powerful, with large iron teeth, as prophesied in the book of Daniel. A good way to illustrate the mentality of Rome is the case of Philip. The Greeks fought to free themselves from the firm hand of Philip, the king of Macedonia, not to be confused with the father of Alexander the Great. There were a total of five kings named Philip. Weary Greeks asked for help from the Romans. The Romans did indeed free them from this despot, but soon it turned out that the little finger of Rome was thicker than Philip's thigh. While Philip lashed the Greeks with whips, the Romans beat them with scourges and axes. Rome willingly fought for the freedom of oppressed peoples. After all, these were the ideals of the Republic. 
However, the Romans did not want to share their freedom with other nations. Those liberated quickly discovered that they had become even more pathetic slaves than before. With exception of Britain, all the permanent conquests of Rome were made by the arms of the Republic, which, though sometimes vanquished in battle, were always victorious in war. But as Roman power increased, Roman virtue declined. It is said of the early Romans that they possessed the faculty of self-government beyond any people of whom we have historical knowledge, with the sole exception of the Anglo-Saxons. And by virtue of this, in the very nature of the case, they became the most powerful nation of all ancient times. But their extensive conquests filled Rome with gold. With wealth came luxury. In the train of luxury came vice. Self-restraint was broken down. The power of self-government was lost. And the Roman Republic failed, as every other republic will fail. When that fails, by virtue of which alone a republic is possible. The Romans ceased to govern themselves, and they had to be governed. They lost the faculty of self-government. And with that vanished the republic, and its place was supplied by an imperial tyranny, supported by a military despotism. Has anyone heard of Aulus Vitellius Germanicus? His name is known to few, and even if they do know him, the only thing they can say about him is that he had a noticeable overweight and two chins. He became a Roman emperor after the death of Nero. He was elevated to power by his Rhine Legion stationed in Germania at Colonia Agrippinensis in the vicinity of present-day Cologne at the beginning of January 69th CE. The fact that he was a degenerate didn't particularly bother anyone in Rome. Julius Caesar once insisted on enacting laws against adultery and bribery, but in reality, he or any senator could break these laws on any opportune occasion. Such was the reality of the imperial empire. Vitellius was a tyrant, and that did concern everyone. Romans quickly grew to hate him. Suetonius wrote that his mutilated body, suspended on a hook, was thrown into the Tiber. Earlier, the people had dragged him through the streets of Rome. He died a terrible death at the age of 54. Not even his dog wept for him. Although people generally know little about the history of Rome, the name Julius Caesar is known to everyone. Gaius Julius Caesar, his name has never been forgotten. The magnificent composer, one of my favorites, George Friedrich Handel, wrote a phenomenal opera about this man. Although the history of Rome plunges into the darkness of centuries and names and great battles are forgotten, the name Julius Caesar, like the name Alexander the Great, has always been surrounded by great esteem. The German word Kaiser, the Slavic Kar, and in the Islamic world Quasar, all have their origins in his name. Julius Caesar was an outstanding military commander. He defeated, among others, the Germans led by Ariovistus and Vercingetorix in the Battle of Elysia, subduing rebellious Gaul, which later became France. Germans and Gauls were not some random wimps. They were big lads, as big as the doors of an aircraft hangar, and extremely fierce at that. Even the Romans felt uneasy in their presence. Did you know that I finally understood that Asterix and Obelix from the comics by Goscinny and Uderzo are literary fiction? Were you aware of that? One learns throughout life. 
Rzymianie miażdżyli wszystko, co tylko napotkali na Romans swoich crushed swoich everything in their path. Few are aware that Caesar was bestowed with the prestigious title of Pontifex Maximus. His insatiable thirst for power ultimately led to his death. His relentless pursuit of absolute authority even turned his once supporters against him. While he was an outstanding leader and a brilliant military strategist, he had one fatal flaw. He underestimated the potent force of human envy and the deep-rooted love Romans held for their old republican freedoms. The elite class foresaw the perilous consequences of Caesar's dictatorial ambitions. Consequently, he was stabbed by senators wielding sharp instruments on the Ides of March, the 15th day of that month in the year 44 BCE, right within the Roman Senate. He was betrayed by those he trusted, including his friend Brutus. It's worth acknowledging that he was quite a hunk, and his image graced many monuments. Bringing such statues to life would indeed be a pure delight. takich posągów to czysta frajda. Po nim nastał czas Octaviana Augusta. After him came the time of Octavian Augustus, who was also an outstanding military commander. However, Octavian was much smarter than Caesar. He donned the mask of hypocrisy and wore it until the end of his life. He maintained the facade of Republican rule, ostentatiously rejecting the titles of a monarch and modestly calling himself Princeps Civitatis and Princeps Senatus, suggesting that he was merely one of the citizens and one of the senators. This was a blatant lie. He pretended to renounce all the titles and honors bestowed upon him by the Senate and the Roman people. In reality, he held in his hands the functions of tribune, princeps senatus, imperator, censor, and pontifex maximus. At the age of 34, Octavian embarked on the path to absolute power. He knew perfectly well the consequences of too overtly displaying his power, learning a valuable lesson from the assassination of Julius Caesar. He demonstrated his humility toward the Senate at every step. Octavian became the state. The title Father of the Nation was something much more than just an honorary title. In reality, when Octavian stamped his foot, senators salivated and bent over in servile bows. As Octavian's dignity became accepted by everyone, the Senate tried to come up with the most prestigious title for him. They scratched their heads and competed with ideas. After much deliberation, someone uttered the word Augustus, which means divine. Everyone was thrilled, especially Octavian himself. Augustus? How does that sound? It was a title that neither Julius Caesar nor anyone else had borne before. Now, hastily, the Senate declared the murdered Julius as a divine being. The new title for Octavian, Augustus, strengthened this trend. Only a few sensed the scent of what it truly meant. Forget about the Republic. Now the divine Octavian Augustus held power over all earthly possessions of his subjects and more. He also became the ruler of their consciences. Octavian became divine, so the Roman Empire he represented became a divine entity worthy of all reverence. The divine Augustus ruled for 43 years. However, he perhaps wasn't divine enough as his reign came to an end on September 19th, 14th AD. In other words, he passed away. He was succeeded by Tiberius, who continued to charm the senators. Like Octavian, he also feigned submission and love for the old republic. 
The Senate dutifully showered him with ever newer honors, titles, and privileges. Unnoticeably, his power grew step by step. This game lasted for nine years, and his rule was as gentle and calm as the rule of a charming little lamb with pink ears. When Tiberius surrounded himself with a powerful guard of defenders and obedient informers, when he discovered that no one and nothing threatened him anymore, that he had reached a level that neither Caesar nor Octavian could reach, then a new era began. Wtedy zaczęła się nowa era. Cesarz August powołał wcześniej... Emperor Augustus had previously established a protection unit for the emperor. They were called the Praetorians, the personal bodyguard of the emperor. Tiberius already had nine cohorts of Praetorians who guarded him day and night. From then on, there was no treachery or crime that he did not commit. One man who became the state, a man who was a god on earth, unrestricted by any earthly or divine force, showed the world what absolute power is. He showed the world what Roman paganism, unrestricted by any barriers, leads to. The most common crime became treason. Since Tiberius was the state himself, every whim of the leader meant heads would roll. Tiberius devised the most elaborate forms of death for the enemies of the empire, and since he defined who was an enemy and who was a friend, no one could feel safe. He murdered members of his own family, senators, aristocrats. He reveled in cruelty. He used to say that a quick death was deserved only by those to whom he had shown mercy. However, as a rule, he did not show mercy. Once a certain Carnulius, upon hearing that the emperor summoned him for a conversation, committed suicide. Tiberius was displeased. Carnulius escaped from me, he said with regret. The divine Tiberius also died, fortunately for the world. After him came Gaius Caesar Germanicus, known as Caligula. This degenerate is well known to everyone. People are much more familiar with Caligula, although they may not realize that he simply imitated everything that Tiberius had done before. He dressed like him, spoke like him, ate like him. He ordered sculptures from Greece to be brought in, beheaded them, and replaced the heads with his own likeness. He engaged in incestuous relationships with close family members. During his reign, people vied to worship the god Caligula. He was convinced of his immortality. In 38 AD, he ordered the killing of the prefect of the Praetorian Guard, Naivius Sutorius Macro. It was a big mistake, but the divine Caligula didn't think about it. In January 41 AD, upon his return from Gaul, he was assassinated in a conspiracy involving Cassius Cheria, a tribune of the Praetorian Guard, Cornelius Sabinus, and several others. Caligula could forget about Sutorius, but the old guard of veterans did not forget. So the rule of Octavian's successors, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, as well as Nero and Domitian, were reigns that revealed the complete degeneration of human nature. I know that there are many who praise ancient Rome as a fairyland of justice and progress. It was not a fairy tale, it was a nightmare. The history of Imperial Rome shows what happens when power has no limits. Human life, whether slave or senator, had no value. Many emperors delighted in humiliating the rich and tormenting the Roman aristocracy. Ancient Rome was the culmination of a mysterious pagan religion that stirred the worst human instincts. The emperor wouldn't move from his seat if a stork flew in the wrong direction across the sky.
To był znak. It was a sign. These people were incredibly superstitious. Zgadzam się, że pośród cesarzy I agree that there was also a period of better rulers among the emperors, such as Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antoninus Pius, or Marcus Aurelius. Ten okres zakończył się jednak However, this period ended with the reign of Commodus. As the Roman historian Tacitus summarized it, The history of Rome is a tale of despotism, perpetual accusations, infidelity in friendship and family, the ruins of innocence. It is a constant repetition of causes leading to the same gloomy event, presenting no novelty due to similarities and the tedious repetition of the same story in successive episodes. The emperors sat on the throne of Rome, elevated to power by primitive soldiery at moments of its caprice. Most of these soldiers never even saw Rome. These lords of Rome obtained absolute power through intrigues and crimes. Among the emperors from Commodus to Constantine, numbering well over 40 who bore the title Imperator Augustus, Only seven of them died a natural death. Two of them, Decius and Valerian, perished at the hands of barbarians, and all the rest met a violent death in the convulsions of a dying empire. Their history will be repeated in the annals of the papacy. For as we will see, the Rome of the Caesars will become the Rome of the Popes. I sat down to think and decided that maybe it was time for something special. Time for a quiz. What is the most dangerous job in the world? Let's consider a few options. How about working on a crab fishing boat in the Arctic Sea, vast frozen expanses, Arctic storms, temperatures below minus 40, and gusty winds? Getting pinched by a crab might not be a big issue, but falling of the deck, especially straight into icy water, is undoubtedly a problem, unless you're a duck. Or maybe a bomb disposal expert? What? It's stressful? The possibility of detonating your own being? Uncomfortable working conditions? It's a dream job for young people who love workplace excursions and a dynamic cohort. No? Let's take a firefighter then. I have great respect for them, but you really need to be tough. It's not a job for someone who is afraid of matches. Oh, I've got one. How about the guy who changes light bulbs on the spire of a skyscraper in Dubai? This guy in a uniform, still on the payroll. The company cares about his working conditions. After all, it's cheaper to hire Kasim on a freelance contract. The company saves money and the guy is also extremely happy to finally have a job in the desert. No, no, I have something truly extreme for you. It's an absolute number one. From the late 9th century, for nearly 250 years, being a Pope becomes the most dangerous job on earth. Except for a few exceptions, Popes generally fall into three categories. Those who ruled shortly, very shortly, or ultra-shortly. It's strange that nobody makes documentaries about it. A few examples. Pope Stephen VI reigned for 216 days. Pope Valentine for 40 days. Pope Boniface VI for 15 days. Pope Romanus for 92 days. Pope Theodore II for 19 days, Pope Leo V for 124 days, Pope Christopher for 92 days. 
Pope Leo VI for 187 days, John XII for 78 days, Pope Benedict the Far for 32 days, Pope Boniface VII for 30 days. And these are just a few of them. I'm afraid even the rock or rap stars, intoxicated with drugs and alcohol, live longer. Lambert died without an heir, so to defend against Berengar and Emperor Arnulf, a new protector for Rome had to be quickly sought. The choice fell on the King of Provence, Louis. In October 900, Louis was first crowned King of Italy in Padua, and in February 901, he entered Rome, where he received the crown of the Holy Roman Empire, and the title of Emperor Louis III. However, the hopes placed in him quickly disappointed. When he withdrew to the north, supporters of Berengar in Rome imprisoned Pope Benedict IV in July 903, and after murdering him, they installed Benedictine Leon V on the papal throne. Within four weeks, he was imprisoned and murdered by Benedict IV's former chaplain, Cardinal Christopher. Vatican sources consider Christopher an antipope, which is unjust, as for six months, Rome had no pope other than Christopher, and there was no desire for a change. Yes, I agree. Republican and Imperial Rome allowed conquered peoples to worship their gods, but these gods, like people who worshipped them, were henceforth subjects of the majesty of Rome and its deities. These people were now slaves of the Empire. Although these exotic deities were added to Rome's pantheon, they stood lower in the hierarchy than Jupiter and the other Roman idols. Christianity, which recognized only one God, who claimed to be above every earthly authority, was completely incompatible with the social and political system of the imperial Rome. As Cicero expressed it, No man shall have his own personal gods. A man shall not worship any of his own deities, unless they have been recognized by the public law of Rome. The empire was synonymous with the highest good for a Roman, the gods were supporting the state, and the state was supporting the gods. Any deviation from this rule was treated as treason and atheism. There was a deep belief that Roman gods ensured blessings and prosperity for the Caesars and the nation. Christianity emerged in Rome just when the glory of the empire was beginning to fade. There was someone to blame for all failures. In Rome, Christians were called atheists, not because they denied the existence of deities. Followers of Christ rejected the claims of the state and the emperor to regulate the relationship between man and God. Such an attitude was synonymous with an accusation of not recognizing the authority of the emperor. In this way, Christianity was equated with other enemies of the empire and in its eyes was more dangerous than others because it became an internal enemy. And the emperor couldn't let that slide. For 250 years, no people professing faith in Christ was sure of the day or hour. They were outcasts. Roman laws did not protect either them or their property. The entire might of the empire was against them. Interestingly, the greatest persecutors of Christians were the best of the Caesars. All these degenerates like Caracalla or Commodus were primarily afraid of the elites not ordinary people. The Emperor Tiberius, in a panic about his life, entrenched himself on the island of Capri. 
from where he issued commands. I don't quite understand. After all, when he became emperor, he was already an old fart. Did he think he would rule forever? Did he have a patent for cryogenics, using liquid nitrogen and grape vinegar? The return to Roman traditions that made Rome a power and to the gods of the Republic meant planned and systematic destruction of Christians. And the punishments intended for enemies of the Roman Empire were particularly severe claiming that the authority of some god surpasses the authority of Rome was both blasphemy and opposition to the state. Jewish religious leaders exploited this nuance perfectly when Christ stood before Pontius Pilate, the governor of the Roman Empire. The spiritual leaders of the nation struck at Pontius Pilate's weakest point. They knew the realities prevailing in the state of Tiberias very well. They suggested that if the governor released Christ, it would show that he doesn't care about the authority of the emperor. It was a masterful move. Tiberius was known for his suspicion and cruelty. He created an extremely effective apparatus of repression and denunciation. It's not about a case where someone vomited on the bust of Tiberius made of alabaster marble. We're talking about trivial matters. The spirit of paranoia is not only a characteristic of our times, informants were everywhere. Even if someone looked askance at a sculpture with his likeness, they risked that the emperor would find out about it from zealous spies. This happened not only in Rome, but also in distant provinces. A person who showed insufficient respect for the emperor's image was subject to the death penalty. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this fellow perverting the nation and forbidding to give tribute to Caesar, saying that he himself is Christ a king. And they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plaited a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. This entire scene is a classic example of the merging of state and church, a pattern that repeatedly appeared throughout world history. Scarlet was the color of power worn by emperors and commanders of the Roman army. This dye was obtained from the sea snail Stramonita hamastoma. It took a considerable number of snails to dye even a small piece of fabric. In the second century AD, Julius Pollux wrote in his work Onomasticon that Hercules was the first to dye his garment purple. Later, he gave it to a nymph named Tyros. This dye was monstrously expensive, and it is the color of Great Babylon from the Book of Revelation. A scepter or staff was also a symbol of power. The crown made from a thorny bush completed the coronation ceremony. They treated Jesus as a usurper who claimed the earthly throne. The marriage of church and state And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, if thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king, speaketh against Caesar. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth, and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha, and it was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. You see, they said it. With these words, they rejected the theocratic principles established under Mount Sinai 1500 years earlier. The God of Israel was supposed to be their king. We have no king 
but Caesar. Israel ceased to be the chosen nation. Their definitive rejection occurred three years later with the stoning of Stephen. These words will be repeated in history many times. Litostrotos is a beautiful place, representing the dignity and solemnity of the judgment seat. And it was in this beautiful place that this shameful farce took place. This is how the combination of church and state works. Beauty and the works of great artists are inseparably linked to earthly kingdoms. Often, the greatest criminals who sat out on thrones were great lovers of sculpture, music and painting. They were also patrons of the greatest artists. Note that atheism also creates such religious adoration of leaders, such a divine cult of the leader in communist states, the competition in the peculiar adoration of the fathers of the revolution had already occurred in the realm of the Caesars. This is a cult, a religion of the individual. People invented the most absurd forms of devotion and the cult of the great Tiberius. The system built by Tiberius was remarkably similar to the efficient surveillance apparatus previously implemented by Herod the Edomite, the king of Judea. Except for degenerates like Nero, such as Domitian, Vitellius, Commodus, Elagabalus or Maximinus, did not persecute Christians. They were not a problem for them, because they were more afraid of military rebellion or senatorial plots. These emperors were not only the worst rulers of Rome, but also the worst individuals in the entire history of the world. They were monsters. The scale of their depravity is difficult to describe in words. On the other hand, the best rulers of Rome did not persecute Christians, not because they were cruel. The philosopher Marcus Aurelius was not only one of the best rulers Rome ever had, but also one of the most brilliant minds of antiquity. Vespasian was a sensible and efficient ruler, but he destroyed the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD and was an enthusiastic murderer of Christians. Add to that Trajan, a soldier and poet, Decius and Diocletian, The controversy between the Christians and the Romans was not a dispute between individuals or a contention between sects or parties. It was a contest between antagonistic principles. It was, therefore, a contest between Christianity and Rome, rather than between Christians and Romans. On the part of Christianity, it was the proclamation of the principle of genuine liberty. On the part of Rome, it was the assertion of the principle of genuine despotism. On the part of Christianity, it was the assertion of the principle of the rights of conscience and of the individual. On the part of Rome, it was the assertion of the principle of the absolute absorption of the individual and his total enslavement to the state in all things, divine as well as human, religious as well as civil, Later, the bishops of Rome inherited the same spirit of despotism, and during the time of Constantine the Great, they transformed into the papacy. When the emperor moves to the new capital of the empire, Constantinople, the bishops of Rome immediately fill the void. Roman bishops began to be treated as arbiters and mediators in important matters. People turned to them to settle theological controversies, and their support was sought in dealings with the emperor. Their religious and secular significance grew rapidly. It is from the 4th century onwards that the popes seriously pursue absolute power. The Triple Crown becomes a symbol of power over heaven, earth and the underworld. The Pontifex Maximus becomes God on earth, and here his kingdom is established. Emperor Diocletian, after the anarchy that occurred in Rome in the 3rd century, restored the Roman giant. He reformed the army, the tax system, and the state administration. 
His actions laid the foundation for the creation of Byzantium, the Eastern Empire. As a good administrator, he postponed for a while what was certain, the inevitable fall of the Roman Empire. Diocletian was one of the greatest persecutors of Christians among all Roman emperors. That's how history remembers him. In reality, he had nothing against Christians. In his empire, Christians held important state functions, and there were many of them, even at the imperial court. However, Galerius, who was a co-ruler, and especially his mother, hated Christianity. The edict against Christians was in force for ten years, but the particularly brutal persecutions lasted for two years. Let's make Rome great again. Diocletian deeply believed that returning with great zeal to the Roman gods would make Rome great again. This was an attempt to return to the traditions and splendor of ancient Rome. Diocletian deeply believed that returning with great zeal to the Roman gods would make Rome great again. This was an attempt to return to the traditions and splendor of ancient Rome. Diocletian, tired of wielding power, withdrew from public life and settled permanently in present-day split Croatia. After him comes Constantine, given the title, The Great. The Edict of Milan was formulated according to the plan of Constantine and Licinius. It was proclaimed in 313, shortly after the severe persecutions of Christians by Diocletian. The Edict of Milan recognized Christianity as one of the religions of Rome, stating, Every person dwelling in the Roman provinces has the privilege to choose and practice their own religion. Persecution ceased. Has the time now come for the era of separation between church and state? Not at all. It quickly became apparent that anyone professing a version of Christianity different from that of the Roman bishops would have a very serious problem. As long as being a Christian was associated with mortal risk, it remained pure and based on biblical principles. In the time of Constantine, there was a paganization of Christianity. Essentially, it becomes a mixture of all the religions of the empire, ranging from the cult of Mithras and Jupiter to the cults of Sibyl and Isis. This amalgamation of paganism with Christian terminology becomes the state religion, Roman Catholic Christianity, or universal Christianity. From this moment onward, woe to anyone who rejects its heretical dogmas. Christian apologists wonder when Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity. One suggests the year 306, another 312, yet another 321. Some argue for the years 323 or 327. There are those who claim it happened on his deathbed, because only then did he receive baptism. This one fact should arouse suspicions. I know a man who didn't want to wait until summer and had himself baptized in a frozen pond in winter. It was 18 degrees below zero at nine in the morning. I know this because I was shivering on the shore. Constantine the Great, however, was in no hurry. I assert that Emperor Constantine never converted. Constantine was the prototype of a typical pagan who adorned himself with Christian symbolism. One historian even called him the archetype of all papists throughout the ages and lands. Emperor Constantine, as Pontifex Maximus, had the right to proclaim religious holidays. Venerably Di Solis is the decree on the elevation of Sunday from the year 321. 
It was the culmination of the ancient pagan practice of worshipping the rising sun, Apollo Phosphorus in the fiery golden chariot riding through the sky, from the dawn till the evening. Have I already said that Apollo worshipped by Constantine was the god of light? The Council of Nicaea in 325 provided another impulse to establish Sunday as the Lord's Day, Dies Solis. From then on, Easter was to be celebrated on Sunday, the day of the sun, not tied, as with the Jews, to the full moon around the 14th day of the month of Nisan. All coins and inscriptions from his time, including the famous triumphal arch after the victory over Maxentius contained pagan solar symbols. Constantine was a worshipper of Apollo, the god of beauty, art, and light. He also revered Mithras, who was essentially the eastern counterpart of Apollo. In his immediate circle, there was no shortage of pagan priests celebrating various ceremonies. He did not abandon this until the end of his days. It is enough to mention Sopater, who conducted mysterious ceremonies during the celebrations related to the founding of Constantinople. The city also brought sanctuaries of Minerva from Lindos in Rhodes, Sibel, from Mount Dindamus, about whom legends circulated that the Argonauts brought her here. Three muses from Mount Helicon, Aoid, Melody, and Nemi. Additionally, Queen of the Sea Amphitrite and the God Pan were also brought here. In the celebrations, the emperor paraded a figure of the goddess Fortuna around the city in an elaborate chariot and ordered her feast to be celebrated every year. There were no signs of a biblical conversion and a change of character in Constantine's life. As he was cruel, so he remained a cruel, depraved man until the end. When he fell ill, just before his death, he sent a letter to the Bishop of Nicomedia, in which he suspected his brothers and their children of poisoning him. He instructed his eldest son to avenge him. Two members of the royal family managed to escape, but six princes met their death. In this regard, a sad paradox can be observed. Emperor Constantine was a greater tyrant and cruel man towards the end of his life than before his alleged conversion. In Catholic hagiography, Constantine is portrayed as a great guardian angel and collaborator of Pope Sylvester. He thus became the prototype of all future despots and criminals raised to the altars. And finally, the supposedly Christian Emperor Constantine died. In his conscience, he had his wife, son, father-in-law, brothers-in-law, and nephew. And if that were not enough, there would be more. Eusebius of Caesarea wrote about Constantine. His thrice-blessed soul in communion with God himself freed from every mortal and earthly vesture. Dear viewers, I sincerely wish you to enter a different heaven than the greatly blessed Emperor Constantine and the immeasurable, devout crowd of other saints and benefactors. It must, with all regret, be conceded that his progress in the knowledge of Christianity was not a progress in the practice of its virtues. His love of display and his prodigality his suspiciousness and his despotism increased with his power. The very brightest period of his reign is stained with gross crimes, which even the spirit of the age and the policy of an absolute monarch cannot excuse. 
Cesarz Theodosius, ostatni władca, który sprawował... Emperor Theodosius, the last ruler who held power simultaneously in both the Eastern and Western Roman Empires, reigned from the year 379. Initially, he ruled alongside Gratian and Valentinian II. He set the goal of enforcing religious unity, just as Diocletian desired a return to the ancient gods. Theodosius, under the influence of the Catholic clergy, aimed for the complete unification of Christianity. His decrees made universal Catholic Christianity the sole official religion of the Roman Empire. The quote from the Edict of Thessalonica in the year 380 reads as follows. It is our desire that all the various nations which are subject to our clemency and moderation should continue to profess that religion which was delivered to the Romans by the divine Apostle Peter, as it has been preserved by faithful tradition and which is now professed by the Hontif Damasus, Bishop of Rome, and by Peter, Bishop of Alexandria. We authorize the followers of this law to assume the title of Catholic Christians. But as for the others, since in our judgment they are foolish madmen, we decree that they shall be branded with the ignominious name of heretics and shall not presume to give to their conventicles the name of churches. They will suffer, in the first place, the chastisement of the divine condemnation, and in the second, the punishment of our authority, that in accordance with the will of heaven, we shall decide to inflict The majority of the population seems to think that inquisitorial actions are exclusively characteristic of the medieval era. No, they started persecuting and killing much earlier. When Emperor Diocletian died, Christians immediately began hunting down other Christians. Despite many subjects of Theodosius being pagans, the emperor was unyielding. His subjects were to be Roman Christians, Catholics. There was no turning back from this. Every deviation from Catholic doctrine became a betrayal of the state. Within 15 years, he issued at least 15 edicts against heretics. Anyone labeled a heretic could not hold any public office. In addition, there were gradual confiscations of property and other means of coercion. The emperor embarked on the path of religious ecumenism and escalating repression against the disobedient, all to the delight of his spiritual advisors. I would like to remind you that in 17th century Poland, non-conformists also could not hold public offices due to aggressive counter-reformation, and Protestant congregations were also destroyed and taken over. This was in line with the guidelines set in Piotr Skarga's Kazania Sejmowe Parliament Sermons. In the year 384, during the reign of Emperor Maximus, a certain Priscillian and his followers were condemned by the Council of Bordeaux as heretics. In response, they appealed to Emperor Maximus for help in resolving the matter. However, three bishops, Ithasius, Magnus and Rufus, intervened with the emperor, and at that point, Priscillian and six others supporting him were beheaded. Initially, the use of force in the Priscillian case sparked strong controversy and became a scandal. However, soon after, Blessed Augustine of Hippo affirmed the justification of killing heretics, and in 447, Pope Leo I, also known as Leo the Great, praised the execution of Priscillian and his followers. Leo proclaimed that killing heretics is just. And at this moment, the complete merger of church and state takes place. However, the church did not yet achieve its full power until the memorable year 
538. For now, the Ostrogoths still stand in its way. Three nations in opposition to Roman papacy, Vandals, destroyed in 534, Heralds in 493, and Ostrogoths in 538, disappear from history due to the actions of the bishops of Rome. Total annihilation. The Visigoths in the Iberian Peninsula and the Lombards in Italy, unfriendly to the papacy, will be conquered later. Charlemagne defeats the Lombards, thus opening the way for the establishment of the Papal States. However, these two nations will not be physically exterminated. This is a precise fulfillment of the prophecy from the book of Daniel about the little horn. Now it gets really interesting. Don't accidentally turn off the receivers. And don't hold a grudge against me, because the truth hurts. There was a rule in the Wild West. You don't shoot the pianist in the saloon. All these boring stories I've been telling you have a deep meaning. Let's focus. King Atalus III, Philometon, Eurogates of Pergamon, the son of Eumenes II, Sota, bequeathed his property and state to Rome. This happened in the year 133 BC. His goal was to protect Pergamon from war with Rome, prevent the takeover of power by the despot Aristonicus, and avoid a rebellion of the poor and slaves. The book of Revelation by John gives us an interesting characterization of Pergamon. It is one of the seven churches mentioned there. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he, which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days, wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. The information about Pergamon is repeated twice. This is the place where Satan resides. But what is it specifically about? Let me explain. In the era of the Greek Empire, Pergamon became the most important and beautiful city in Greece. Its library was second only to the one in Alexandria. What was in this library? All the secret knowledge of Babylon, the great treasure of occultism. Pergamon also had temples dedicated to Athena Nikephoros, Hera, Demeter, and the world-famous Altar of Zeus, that is, the Queen of Heaven and the Roman Jupiter. It was a masterpiece of Hellenistic art. After the Persian king Cyrus conquered Babylon, he expelled the priests of Esagila from there. They all moved to Pergamon. They brought with them tablets and scrolls. Babylon was previously the center of the mysterious religion of antiquity. Forget about Egypt. Egyptians and Assyrians always drew from the mysteries of Babylon. Along with the Babylonian priesthood, the title Pontifex Maximus moved to Pergamon. It meant the highest priest of the mysteries. From then on, it was the title of the rulers of Pergamon from the Attalid dynasty. And now let's look at the temptation scene in the desert. Now, 
Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. The words of Satan imply that all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor belong to him, meaning all the glory of earthly monarchs and their titles comes from him. This is a sign of Cain from the book of Genesis. We remember that in the symbolism of biblical prophecy, the beast represents an earthly kingdom. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? So step by step, Satan transfers his throne, power and great authority to an earthly kingdom. This refers to the successive empires from the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel, which includes Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and finally, Rome. Rome is the last one. The monarch of the empire becomes its vassal, receiving all attributes, crown, privileges, power, and authority from Satan. Now, let's get to the heart of the matter. The title Pontifex Maximus was in Pergamon since the time of Cyrus. Of course, it wasn't called that in Latin. This term signifies the authority of the highest priest of pagan mysteries. Atalos III, the king of Pergamon, with his kingdom, offered the title Pontifex Maximus to Rome. It now becomes the property of Rome, specifically the Roman Senate. We are still in the period of the Republic, but the times of the emperors are coming. The obedient Senate bestows this title on the first emperor. In 63 BCE, on the day of the election, a young Julius Caesar, leaving his home, kissed his mother affectionately. He tenderly bid her farewell, stating that he would either return home as Pontifex Maximus or never return. His concerns turned out to be exaggerated. He received more votes than all the other candidates combined. The people of Rome and the senators still loved him. Julius Caesar becomes the highest priest of mysteries, Pontifex Maximus. After him, the title passes on to subsequent emperors, Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, and so on. Attention! And now, time for a dessert. In 382 CE, Flavius Gratianus Augustus, or Gratian, the Western Roman Emperor, influenced by Ambrose, renounces the title Pontifex Maximus. Ambrose was the Bishop of Milan, now a saint in the Catholic Church. And precisely at that moment, when the Roman Emperor Gratian renounces the role of Pontifex, he transfers it to the bishops of Rome. This is how the papacy is established. And it is not a separate entity. It is a continuation of the Roman Empire. Even the language remains the same, and the Senate becomes the Roman Curia. There is something more. It is a direct continuation of the supreme authority of paganism embodied in the title Pontifex Maximus. I'm sorry, dear ones, but two and two make four. Therefore, in the 14th chapter of the Apocalypse, the second angel declares, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. You can, of course, ignore this information. The choice is yours. But my advice is this. Flee from Babylon.
After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. It devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of man, and a mouth speaking great things. Thy papacy is precisely that little horn that emerges from the fourth kingdom, Rome, originally a republic and later the empire of the Caesars. It is the precise fulfillment of the prophecy. No other kingdom meets the criteria of this prophecy, only the Roman papacy. Absolutely, no one else boasts the title Pontifex Maximus. Verify it. Officials from every church worldwide, I repeat, from every church worldwide, bow before this title. They don't have to do it officially. They may belong to organizations such as the World Council of Churches, Together for Europe, Working Group of Christian Churches, Global Christian Forum, Protestant Federation, Evangelical Alliance, and dozens of others. The sheep are to be faithful, passive, obedient, and unaware. You can ask your pastor why your church actively participates in these bows before the Pontifex Maximus, such as the significant meeting in Rome on September 30th, 2023. In the prophecy, we read that Rome will be different from the other kingdoms. Its distinctiveness lies in the fact that it has no king. Rome emerged as a republic, a self-governing entity. Its distinctiveness also lies in inheriting all the characteristics of previous kingdoms, and its authority lasts until the end of the world. Republican Rome becomes Imperial Rome and ultimately transforms into Papal Rome. The Ten Horns are the states that arose from the ruins of the Roman Empire of the Caesars. This little horn is the papacy. It can arise only after the complete destruction of the opposition from three nations, the Heruli, Vandals, and Ostrogoths. This is about it as the quote goes, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Said Apostle Paul, the Antichrist was to appear in the church of God and exalt himself above all, claiming to be God. And that's exactly what happened. Paul added also, And now ye know what withholdeth, that he might be revealed in his time. The elevation of the papacy to power became possible only after the fall of the Roman Empire of the Caesars and the opposition of those three nations. When Gratian renounces the title of Pontifex Maximus, there is an official transition from Rome of the Caesars to Rome of the Popes. The bishops of Rome still have to wait a little longer for the complete demise of the Empire of the Caesars. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. In the book of Revelation, we have confirmation of Daniel's prophecy. This beast has all the characteristics of the lion, Babylon, the bear, Medo-Persia, and the leopard, Greece. And the dragon gave it his power, his throne, and great authority. The transfer of the title of Pontifex Maximus is the transfer of the throne and authority to the papacy. 
Thus, the Roman Empire becomes the Holy Roman Empire, and paganism takes on a new form. Leo I, who later became a saint in the Catholic and Orthodox churches, ruled on the papal throne in Rome, when the Colossus of the Western Roman Empire was crumbling before his eyes. Był papieżem od roku 440 do He served as Pope from 440 to 461. Leo elevated Roman bishops above other Christian bishops. As we have seen, this has been a lengthy process. However, on Leo I it archives its breakthrough. The Bishop of Rome no longer has to fight with the other bishops of Christendom. He is the victor. And from now on, the popes will fight the emperors. He set out to eradicate the departure from universal Christianity, meaning Catholicism. He labeled it heresy. In 432 letters and 96 homilies, this pope preached the dogma of the supremacy of the Roman bishop in the entire church. This is unbiblical. He claimed that the papacy derived its power from Christ, who supposedly handed it to the Apostle Peter. Peter, in turn, allegedly passed it on to his successors. This is also inconsistent with the Bible. In 451, at the Council of Chalcedon, its participants exclaimed that the voice of Leo was like the voice of the Apostle Peter himself. Both the Eastern and Western empires, under Valentinian III, recognized his supremacy. The emperor proclaimed it earlier by decree in 444. Ironically, it was under Valentinian that the Western Roman Empire lost most of its territories, essentially remaining only in Italy. It is here, on the ruins of the building, that the popes from Leo onwards strengthened their throne, like a weed growing amidst the debris. It is immensely interesting how the papacy managed to subordinate kings and their subjects. Rome, jealous of all temporal sovereignty but her own, for centuries yielded up, or rather made, Italy a battlefield to the Transalpine and the stranger, and at the same time so secularized her own spiritual supremacy as to confound altogether the priest and the politician to degrade absolutely and almost irrevocably the kingdom of Christ into a kingdom of this world. The contest began even with Justinian, who had done so much to exalt the dignity and clear the way of the papacy. Justinian soon became proud of his theological abilities and presumed to dictate the faith of the papacy rather than to submit, as formally, to her guidance. And, from AD 542 to the end of his long reign in 565, there was almost constant war with alternate advantage between Justinian and the popes. But as emperors live and die, while the papacy only lives, the real victory remained with her. Catholic writers portray popes as the source of blessing and happiness for all of humanity. However, when we examine the specifics, the Catholic Spain endured only through the tons of gold plundered from the New World. The majority of society lived there in poverty and terror oppression. When Napoleon's soldiers opened the dungeons of the Inquisition in the early 19th century, massacred human shadows crawled out of them. In the 20th century, Francisco Franco tortured opposition figures using methods and tools reminiscent of the Spanish Inquisition. The territories of Catholic Italy since the 4th century when the papacy, in union with Constantine, became a political entity, witnessed endless wars. Until 1870, Italy was a land of continuous bloodshed. 
Even in the mid-20th century, over half of Italy's citizens were illiterate. Thus he said, the fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise, and another shall rise after them, and he shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. After the collapse of the Roman Empire, ten nations took control of its territory. After the destruction of the Ostrogothic opposition, the papacy faced a problem. It established its state in Italy, with Rome at its center. However, the Lombards claimed the right to the same territory. In the prophecy of Daniel it is written, His power shall be great, but not by his own power. This is a precise summary of the entire history of the papal Caesars. Charles Martel, who impressively defeated the Saracens at Poitiers in October 732, became a target for the papacy. Pope Gregory III sweetened him and sent the keys to the tomb of St. Peter to him, more importantly, declaring himself the heir to the imperial authority of Rome. He bestowed the title of Roman Consul upon Charles. The Lombards were doubly hated because they sought to take over Italy and did not allow Catholic bishops to meddle in politics. This time, the Pope failed to set Charles Martel against the Lombards. However, the papacy is very patient. In these words, the next Pope, Stephen III, incited the Franks against the Lombards. I, Peter the Apostle, protest, admonish, and conjure you, the most Christian kings, Pepin, Charles, and Carloman, with all the hierarchy, bishops, abbots, priests, and all monks, all judges, dukes, counts, and the whole people of the Franks. The Mother of God likewise adjures you and admonishes and commands you. She, as well as the thrones and dominions, and all the hosts of heaven to save the beloved city of Rome from the detested Lombards. If ye hasten, I, Peter the Apostle, promise you my protection in this life and in the next will prepare for you the most glorious mansions in heaven, will bestow on you the everlasting joys of paradise. Make common cause with my people of Rome, and I will grant whatever ye may pray for. Papacy claimed their descent from the Apostle Peter. However, in his first letter in the fifth chapter, Peter wrote about his position in the church. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. The term apostle has nothing to do with having special privileges and authority over others. Apostolos means a messenger of the gospel, a preacher. 
The term clear of clergy in the New Testament referred to all the faithful of the church, translated here as flock of God. In this passage, Peter uses the term katakirievo, directly referring to the words of Christ, who spoke about the kings of the earth, those who exercise power over people. Maintaining that the Apostle Peter was the first pope is a plain heresy, a departure from biblical truth. Now, let's look at the church. It doesn't matter which one or where. Consider these two figures. A common motif on the facades of churches. The one on the left holds a net, capturing everything that comes its way, from the mud at the bottom of ordinary criminals, through newborns to the elderly. In the end, even Italian mafiosos were buried with great pomp, surrounded by church dignitaries. The one on the right holds a sword. If someone refuses to become a devout citizen, this figure with the sword will do everything to change their mind. It symbolizes the union of church and state. Catholicism cannot survive without state support. This is the only reason why it still exists, despite experiencing all the highs and lows. It endures through the centuries and thrives. I assure you, it will last until the end of the world, despite voices predicting its imminent downfall. There is no other possibility. Politicians and clergy, state and church, wherever this doctrine is preached, we have a pagan system of wielding power. This is the wine of Babylon from the book of Revelation. It is not Christianity. Let's listen to two stories from the Old Testament. When the church and the state unite, blood is shed. That's why the prophet Isaiah was killed, why the prophet Jeremiah was persecuted. Christ was sentenced to death exactly according to this principle. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name, and sealed them with his seal, and sent the letters unto the elders, and to the nobles, that were in his city, dwelling with Naboth. And she wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast, and set Naboth on high among the people, and set two men, sons of Belial, before him, to bear witness against him, saying, Thou didst blaspheme God and the king, and then carry him out, and stone him, that he may die. And the men of his city, even the elders and the nobles, who were the inhabitants in his city, did as Jezebel had sent unto them, and as it was written in the letters which she had sent unto them. Then Amaziah the priest of Bethel sent to Jeroboam king of Israel, saying, Amos hath conspired against thee in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos saith, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel shall surely be led away captive out of their own land. Also Amaziah said unto Amos, O thou seer, go, flee thee away into the land of Judah, and there eat bread, and prophesy there. But prophesy not again any more at Bethel, for it is the king's chapel, and it is the king's court. I recommend the book of Daniel. The symbols are so clear. The angel provides guidance on how to interpret these symbols. It is a prophetic book that repeatedly describes the emergence of the papacy and its characteristics. Chapter 8 confirms and expands on the information about the appearance of the papal empire. The horn represents a king. The goat from the next passage represents Alexander the Great, who ended the rule of the Medo-Persian Empire. 
Aleksander nie miał synów. Alexander had no sons. When the young dying king was asked who should succeed him, he replied, the strongest. The time of war arrived. Four generals of Alexander divided his vast empire among themselves. Ptolemy, Seleucus, Lysimachus and Cassander. The first two became the most powerful. Soon Rome would take over the remnants of the Greek superpower. And from this fourth beast, Papal Rome would emerge. The king with a fierce countenance is the same little horn from the seventh chapter and the king of the north from the eleventh book of Daniel. Little horn, because its emergence would be gradual, without much fanfare. Over the centuries, it would achieve new goals and overcome obstacles. Eventually, it would attain absolute power. The ram which thou sawest having two horns are the kings of Media and Persia, and the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. Now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in his power. And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, a king of fierce countenance and understanding dark sentences shall stand up, and his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. His power will be mighty, but not by his own strength. As we will see in the next chapter, no country in the world is able to fulfill the criteria of this prophecy. Only and solely papal Rome. A certain forgery gave the popes a tool to continually strengthen their power until the kings of the earth became powerless before it. The donation of Constantine, also known as the Constitutum Constantini, consists of two parts. The first part, the Confessio, is a fabricated account of the conversion to Christianity by Emperor Constantine. As mentioned, Constantine was and remained a pagan. Initially, he opposed Emperor Galerius, who persecuted Christians. Galerius, to streamline legal processes, abolished defenders. This significantly shortened the process of issuing judgments, allowing anyone to be condemned without evidence. Do we see a similar trend intensifying in our times? Constantine disagreed with Galerius, did not support his hostility towards Christianity, and by extension supported the bishops. Later, when he became emperor, he entered into a union with the bishops of Rome to strengthen his rule. The second part of the donation of Constantine, called the Donatio, is a list of assets supposedly granted to the bishops of Rome by Constantine. This part also lists papal titles and privileges. The donation of Constantine is the most famous forgery in the history of Western culture. All these fabricated privileges and the concocted right for the Pope to reign above earthly kings are based on forged papal letters from Clement in the year 100 to Gregory the Great in the year 600. All these inflated pieces of evidence were compiled by Isidore Mercator in the 9th century, hence the name Pseudo-Isidorian Documents. The forgery was only proven in the 15th century, thanks to the work of, among others, researcher Lorenzo Valla.
Many intellectuals, including Dante Alighieri and Erasmus of Rotterdam, ridiculed the forgery. Nevertheless, the donation of Constantine continued to function in the Catholic Church as confirmation of its spiritual and secular authority until the 19th century and even longer in Italy, Spain and Portugal. This is not the only forgery in the history of the so-called Siapita. Before the 10th century, Byzantine church fathers complained that in case of any theological controversies, representatives from Rome appeared at synods armed with stacks of allegedly ancient documents supporting their arguments. Of course, no one had heard of these papers before. Monks created such documents on demand, and entire monastic workshops produced manuscripts with an ancient appearance to strengthen the growing lust for power of successive papal Caesars. After all, the end justifies the means. As Ignatius Loyola used to say, I read on Google that there were only 3.7% bad popes. I wonder what method they use for such calculations. How do they define evil? The falsification of history is progressing well. Have you noticed that there are no documentary films about the history of the papacy? I admit, there is one documentary, Saints and Sinners, I haven't heard of others. This topic is strangely avoided by documentarians. Odd, isn't it? Since the papacy has existed for 2,000 years, it would be worth showing its magnificent history. The problem is this. The history of the papacy clearly shows that these are the deeds of demons, not saints. If this is the only true Christianity, it should bear the fruits of rebirth that come to a person through the working of the Spirit of God. I will quote the Apostle Paul. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such there is no law. In the case of the saints and infallible bishops of Rome, it is a history of genocide, lies, despotism, forgeries, bloody intrigues, simony, torture, adultery, nepotism, incest, and all other crimes. There is really nothing to be proud of. This does not fit today's narrative. In these people, from the very beginning, there were only such qualities. Here, I will quote Paul again. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Well, I think it's a good moment to end this part. In the next, we will delve into further twists and turns of history. Unfortunately, we will also address Protestantism, a painful and relevant topic. Greetings to all my history teachers. It's a bit late, as most of them probably aren't alive anymore. Now I regret being such a bad apple. I'm really sorry. But I'm afraid you had not told me about some important topics. I must admit today that history can be incredibly fascinating. Thank you.